And this presentation in the latter half is going to talk about what's called the map of maps that was produced as part of the work done by Seville during its pre-inception stage. Uh, that is work being led by, by 3IU, to get to grant credit to 3IU, who was um, in the last session. Um, I'll just say a little bit about the, about the history of mapping. So at um, Campbell, just a Shrita uh, Saran has just produced a paper on evidence mapping, we'll be publishing as a Campbell discussion paper um, in the next month or so. So evidence mapping has quite a lot of history in the evidence census community. Evidence census was doing evidence mapping back in, in the 1980s. Um, but evidence mapping in this development really was um, start taking a look in, in 3IE, and particularly the way in which evidence gap maps are presented uh, is, has come out of 3IE. And I'm going to talk a bit about evidence mapping with evidence gap maps using 3IE as an example, and then I will uh, go on to about the map of maps. Just a short commercial break. If you do want to learn more about the set of our mailing list, is out on the registration desk outside. We have a three staff here in the London office of set of the IDC, so Eduardo and Marcella here, and uh, Jennifer at the back there. So you also give Jennifer your card if you want to um, start be on the mailing list. Um, Jennifer, stand up second, tell them who I'm talking about. So you can uh, just be in touch with them if you want to get on the mailing list. We have a number of events coming up at set so. To do stay in touch. So back back to yeah, evidence mapping. So well, what is an evidence map? So the definition is there's not a single definition. This one that I use doesn't not work out. So it's systematic presentation of all evidence, particular sector or subsector. So the key word there is systematic. So evidence maps come out of a systematic evidence synthesis approach. So when you do an evidence map, it is based on a, a clearly defined, what we call a peak codes, we define basically the scope of the map, the population you're interested in, the interventions you're interested in, the outcomes you're interested in, are clearly defined ex ante at protocol stage. So you have clearly defined inclusion and exclusion criteria, do a comprehensive search with a comprehensive screening against those criteria, preferably done by two people, so applying proper systematic principles to, to creating the map. Um, a typical map of the sort that 3IE does, and Campbell will be publishing these maps also very soon, is a matrix. So we'll see an example with interventions and categories and subcategories and the outcome domains and subdomains in the columns. Um, you can then apply what I call additional dimensions. So the main two dimensions of the map are the rows and columns and interventions and outcomes. Additional dimensions might be population subgroups, countries, regions, uh, areas of conflict, um, children with disabilities, whatever, and you can apply the filter to screen the evidence to just show the evidence applied to that subpopulation. Um, the evidence in the map can be global. Most maps are global evidence or for low middle income countries, as 3 well IU does. They could be regional. They could even be country specific, but we wouldn't encourage on Campbell. Uh, but you can always filter by region. The evidence, this is an evidence synthesis product, like all evidence synthesis products, evidence synthesis, systematic reviewing, is a philosophy, it's an approach. It can be applied to any question. So actually, Charlotte this morning mentioned when she put up a map of the prevalence of uh, violence against women and girls. That was based on a systematic review of population uh, data on violence against women and girls. So that was a systematic review, a prevalence review. So you can do reviews on anything. Most reviews published currently by 3IE and Carol and so on are effectiveness reviews. They focus on study of effects of impact evaluations, RCTs, and valid knowledge benefit signs. But you can do an evidence map, including process evaluations, prevalence studies. You define the scope. You just have to be systematic about it. You need clear, upfront what you do, and you have clear inclusion and exclusion criteria. Maps we're going to look at are effectiveness maps. Remember, you could do it for anything. So the effectiveness maps include primary studies and reviews of effects, um, and they have multiple dimensions. So the two main ones being interventions and outcomes, but you can define additional dimensions applied by filtering. So here's an example. So this is from the 3IE one of the 3IE maps. This was adolescent sexual reproductive health. And what we see are the only very small section of the map goes much further down. You have a number of intervention categories, normally 
four or five. Our number in terms of subcategories for each category normally four or five. So it's typically 20, 25 rows. Then you have a number of outcome domains, adolescent behavior, adolescent health, health services. So I should have said this on adolescent sexual reproductive health. So these are all adolescent health behaviors, uh, sorry, outcomes. They're normally, if possible, organized along the causal chain. That's not always possible, but here's some attempt at that. And then for each outcome domain, you have a number of subdomains, and again, it's roughly four or five of these, four or five per category. So you're looking at 25 by 25. Once you get much more than that, it doesn't put the page anymore, so it's harder mm -hmm. to navigate and stuff. Some maps are big, depends of course on the scope of the map, it's a big scope, then it's going to be much bigger. So, oh, I've got one ad, of course, on Friday we had Campbell's do a child welfare mega map, a very big map, and they're presenting that on Friday at their ward house just around the corner, so you can still sign up and, and come for that uh, consultation on the mega map. Um, then on the map, once we've got in any one cell, tells you, well, <coughs> if you're interested in interventions to provide training and youth uh, friendly service adjustments, and you want to know how, what's the evidence of that on HIV, um, and it's a testing an instance, then you can see here there's actually studies relating to that, where the grey circles refer to primary studies, and the size of a circle refers to a number of studies, so it's another dimension. So we've got to actually capital the number of studies beside the open space by the size of the circle. And the colored circles correspond to systematic reviews. So you're putting into the, into the cell reviews and primary studies separately. And the circles for uh, reviews are color coded, and it's a color coding scheme according to quality of review. So again, size of circle depends on number of reviews, and basically, um, there's it's a traffic light system, so red is low, high risk of bias or low quality, uh, low, co low confidence is what they use, low competence in the results, orange is medium competence and green is high competence in the review. Based on some criteria, you can find on the 3RA website, all the reviews have been set, assessed against those criteria, and so they assign a category of low, medium or high competence in the findings of that review. Uh, there's also, if they include ongoing studies, there's also a color code for that. So currently actually only seeing orange on this page, so that's all medium uh, confidence. A couple of points on interpreting, on using the map. As I said, there's a, a filter, so population up at the top there, go back a page, top right there is this population. Zoom in on that, you can click on it, it's a pull down menu, so you can pick any one of those categories, I think only one, and filter the evidence to just see the evidence applying to that category. So we pick on, pick on, um, in there, okay, can't see it, it's not fit, doesn't fit. If you, if, if you look at this bit you can't see, um, you'll see that I've clicked on conflict affected zones, okay, and when we screen the evidence for that, you see there's actually no studies in that space. Mm -hmm. So when we didn't have that filter on, we got this, and once we get the filter on, we get this. So there's actually no studies in that space. Um, yeah, it's a shame about that. So once, once we're using the map, the maps are interactive. So that means you can hover your mouse or hover your pointer thingy um, over the circle. This is quite a big circle. So there are seven impact evaluations on, in this cell. And it gives you a list of the seven, the first author, year, and the name of the study and the country to which it applies if it's a, it's a primary study, so it's a country. And then you can actually click on any one of those seven studies, and it takes you to the database. The three I have a database of reviews and private studies. So all the studies in the, in the maps are in the three I database. So you can click through from the map down to the underlying database record, and you can also link to the source, the original article that's being referred to there. That source might be behind a paywall. There's nothing we can do about that. So you might find Oh, I can't access the article, but you will, if you scroll down through the database record, find a summary of the study, both study design and study findings. Um, so you get the information you want from that output. Just a few more points on interpreting the map. The first one is, because these interventions are closely related, these outcomes are closely related, then you might see this, oh wow, there's like you know, 30 or 40 reviews here. These are all the same review. Okay? It's the same review appearing in multiple cells. 
If you hover on it, you'll see that, you'll see the same name comes up. But it's, it's one review, not 12. So people sometimes get a bit, you know, oh wow, look at that evidence. But actually, it's a very interesting study. So 3 i has a map of um, education uh, interventions, and 3 i did a study covering the education interventions. So that review appears in every cell, virtually, on the map. And it's not like, you know, 30, 200 studies, it's just one study appearing lots of times. So that's one source of confusion. The other is, remember what the map is telling you. It's, the map's important point is maps tell you what evidence is there, don't tell you what it says. But the second one is that if we see something like this, where you've got a colored dot but no gray dot, these are empty reviews. So there's, there is a study looking at this particular combination, vouchers and subsidies, personally, uh, and I can't read that for whatever this outcome is, and there's a review there, but there are no primary studies. So this must be an empty review. There's no actual primary studies there. So we actually don't have evidence of what works in this area. We just have a review saying, oh, there is no evidence in this area. Mm. Okay, so that's an important point we're looking at it. So this actually is a gap if you're interested in primary studies. These are gaps. They've got dots in for the gaps. There are obviously more obvious gaps. Uh, I'll come to the second. Uh, let's go straight to it now. There are more obvious gaps like this one. Here's a gap. There's nothing. So this is a gap. So here, you would want to do a review, Mr. Nathaniel would have to this in the morning. You don't want a commission reviews when you turn out they're empty. We learned that obvious lesson the hard way by commissioning notes. So you do an evidence map first of all, and say, well, well there's no evidence there. We need to do more primary studies, not, um, ev not evidence, uh, not commission reviews. If you come to the Child Welfare <laughs> Mega Map on Friday, which you really should, you'll see very huge swathes of empty areas in the Mega Map around the non-traditional areas of child welfare, around trafficking and sexual abuse and child rights and so on, just evidence-free zones. Uh, and so you can identify these uh, fairly quickly using an, an evidence map. Going back up, here you've got an area where there's a lot of primary studies, but there are no reviews. So here's an area where interest in this area you should be commissioned from reviews. So the map can help you climb in on areas where you can do primary studies and areas where you can do reviews. So why we want to use evidence of gap maps, they guide users, program managers, or your informed program managers that want to know about the evidence, they can find it using evidence of gap map. Why is it better than using Google? Then using Google for two reasons. The first is it guides you to the evidence in a very clear, structured way. I'm interested in this intervention category, these outcomes, or oh, there it is. If you, if you put those same search terms into Google, intervention and outcome, you'd get five million hits. And that might sound great, you have to actually go through the five million hits and you don't know which are good evidence which ones aren't. We've, someone's done that work for you. Okay, someone's actually been through all those five million hits and said, well, actually, there's three studies here worth looking at of good quality, just look at these. So the evidence map has gone, gone and actually corrects that knowledge in a way that makes it more usable to the end user. But a primary use has been referred to already. Um, it's telling users where there's no high quality evidence, and we heard this morning from uh, IRC, and I think also from, um, sorry, I'm going blank, that's the certification group, um, that actually getting able to go to fund and say that there's no evidence in this area is actually also very important. But also for program managers, say working on um, child trafficking, just to know, oh, we can't say we've lived in space programs, but there are no evidence in this area. So we really need to be working on getting evidence uh, in this particular area. But particularly, this is important for uh, commissioners of research. Commissioners of research should, be, should not ever be commissioning research without doing evidence maps. You're just not doing your job properly with doing that. Because you want to identify where there's lots of existing research, where are the gaps, and we saw a bit of that already this morning as well. So you really need to be thinking about using these maps. Really all research councils around the world should be using evidence maps. It's a great surprise. Uh, but they're not. We're working on that. So there's a range of evidence synthesis product, and there's sort of trade-off between scope and content. So your traditional review, which reviews primary studies, has quite a limited scope, but is um, <coughs> but it's very deep on content, has a lot of content. Whereas evidence and gap maps have a broader scope, but they actually don't have so much content. You don't have this gap map, just code, basic study identifiers, or even put in your filters, like region, country, groups covered, and so on. Whereas a, a review, of course, codes all the effect sizes and various other moderators and so on. In between, you have reviews of reviews, which are uh, reviews of some of the existing reviews, have broader scope, but less content. Um, evidence of gap map, I don't know, it should be down there. 
Enzyme gap maps um, include reviews and primary studies. So a review and review just includes reviews. The enzyme gap maps includes reviews and primary studies. Has a broader scope still, but includes again even less content than review and reviews. We're then producing a mega map, so it's a map of really broad scope. And that mega map only includes reviews and evidence of gap maps. So it doesn't include any primary studies. And then I'm presenting here today, oh, there, that's what I said. I'm presenting here today the map of maps. The map of maps only includes maps. Doesn't include reviews <laughs> or primary studies, only includes maps. Not the map of maps, okay? This gets very esoteric, but we get very excited about this stuff. Believe me. You don't want to be home in the evening when I get home and say, you can hear about the map maps we do. It's so exciting. And Campbell is launching, and this is new, so you're perhaps past here, the Global Evidence Mapping Initiative, where we plan to make a global evidence map based on all the global evidence gap maps being produced to make a single database of all studies in the world of effects across both developed and developing countries in a single database. So we're working that on with Epicenter, we're doing our platform to work in these gap maps, and the idea is basically everything that gets done goes through every reviewer, so it's linked to subsequent reviews, and all the studies are coded, the common coding <laughs> framework, uh, people then use coming down into online data for all studies in the world. Won't be ready next month, so we don't come back quite yet, but that's the long-term project we're, we're working on. So this is the same information again, basically, that you go from scope, from systematic reviews, through to the global evidence map, and they range in scope, although this covers everything, um, and the first two total evidence says, but the rest actually just total evidence is there, which is an important distinction. Um, so now let's talk about the map of maps, which has been produced by 3 I as part of SEDL. Um, the point of the here is listed all first, and is supported as part of SEDL, support which is funded by DFID. And the intervention sectors, the categories in the rows, are taken from the World Bank um, sector classification. And the outcome categories come from the Sustainable Development Goals. So that's the framework, the cot rows and the columns. And the main findings, you're not going to spend a lot of time on it. So here's the map, the map's online, you go to the 3i website and you can get to the map. So there you've got the sectors and the SDGs across the way. Um, and it's mapping only, only other maps. So all of, everywhere you see a, a circle refers to maps. The bigger the circle, the more maps there are. Um, overall, we found 73 maps. So that was more than I expected. 73 uh, maps have been done in, in international development space. Uh, 55 which are completed and 18 ongoing. So it's not a huge number, but it's bigger than expected. And surprise, surprise, it's grown rapidly over time because no one's really doing them seven years ago. Then it's taken off, and, and this is low because 2017 we just started when we were doing this work. We would expect this to be up here in time as well. Um, so there's a growth in these things. We expect many more to come on with IRC doing them. And um, other organisations, site savers doing them, other organisations, USA is doing them, mostly following the, the, mod, the 3 IE model, and Canada collaboration will start publishing the Canada library before the end of the year. We have a number three going on right now, also in the development space. The distribution of maps, not surprisingly, is in traditional areas of health and education, uh, but also quite a lot of agricultural development and um, quite a little, there's something else as well. Up here. And quite like climate change, this because the uh, collaboration environment, environmental evidence does evidence maps, so there's quite a lot up here. With other areas like energy and transport and stuff down here, and even humanitarian, and surprisingly, wash, because it's quite an evidence intensive area, there are not many maps. So there's clearly um, gaps in the coverage of the maps, so there are gaps in evidence of gap maps. There as well, we'd like to have more maps. Um, similarly, when you look across the outcome categories, focused in health and education, and down on SDGs around marine resources, where I think that'll be a really important area, we're going to realise in a few years, climate change, consumption and so on, very little work being done. And again, washing and energy infrastructure areas where there's not a lot of mapping of the evidence. Um, based on this analysis and discussion with DFID, Senegal's producing three maps, one on transport, um, broad one, one on uh, intervention people with disabilities, and one on access to justice. So these are maps we're doing right now in Campbell as part of our contribution to SEDL, and they'll be published early next year. We'll be presenting them at SEDL event in, in January. <coughs> okay, so then I mentioned that we're doing the Global Evidence Map Initiative. 
So imagine our new platform would represent a common underlying database with the global evidence uh, map. So thank you. So let's gamble. See you at GIS 2018 next year. Get the post from outside and come for our presentation on Friday. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, so the paper I'm going to present is, um, is prepared for SEDL, and part of the mission of SEDL is to develop methods for impact and learning. And this particular one was focusing on evidence synthesis methods. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors uh, and also the people who commented on the work in progress, which is immensely helpful. Now, our driving principle was that evidence synthesis should focus on what's agreed to be important rather than dictated by what's perceived to be methodologically easier to do. And in international development, that makes things really complicated. Uh, because what's, what's important might be issues that are, are really complex, that we're trying to understand the nature and scale of them. Uh, the, their complexity and concept, conceptual issues, influences sometimes very long uh, causal pathways for interventions. Um, users quite often want to know more about the context, the, the challenge of taking findings from one place and using them in another, the challenge of um, thinking about uh, packages of interventions, not individual ones, and thinking long term for resilience and sustainability, inequalities, um, and developing policies and practices, not just assessing ones that are, are complete. And uh, we're often working in areas where research is sparse and where circumstances are fast changing, and working across uh, academic disciplines and policy sectors. So to cope with that, uh, we're starting with uh, three assumptions. One is that methods for synthesis vary. We've got quite a lot to build on. They vary in terms of their purpose, the methods, and the institutional support available. The relevance of any synthesis depends on having good stakeholder perspectives and participation to shape the focus of the work and that advancing research synthesis, the conduct of it, goes hand in hand with advancing the use of synthesis. So those, those are our building blocks, really. And uh, thinking first about uh, how synthesis methods vary, uh, this illustrates a spectrum of methods where for, for any single method, we start with a, a question that drives the review and the key concepts that are part of that question, then the procedures for answering it, and then how we can draw out conclusions and what we end up with. So looking at this spectrum, on the right-hand side are the reviews that people tend to be more familiar with. They tend to be the hypothesis te testing reviews, where there's, uh, we're clear about the concepts in advance and we use very formalized methods to bring the research together, sometimes statistics, and the intention is that this is a very instrumental use of research to inform decisions. But there are also, on the left-hand side, other uh, research synthesis methods that are much more qualitative, the questions are more open, the intention is to learn the, what the key concepts are from the literature, the procedures are less formalized, we draw conclusions by uh, developing theory and aim to enhance our understanding. So all the different types of questions should fit somewhere within that spectrum. Then we can also think it's not only that spectrum of going from whether key concepts in advance are clear or not, but also whether we're trying to produce reviews that are public goods reviews that will be 
done to a standard where they can be put on a shelf and taken and used by anybody who wasn't part of the process and uh, doesn't understand the limitations from the inside. Or whether they are rapid reviews done for an immediate purpose, just for a local decision. So this, uh, this matrix brings those, those two dimensions together. So on the left hand side, we've got the public goods reviews addressing common problems with generalizable evidence. On, and on the right hand side, we've got the urgent, immediate, local problems addressed by reviews. And then the top row uh, is where key concepts are clear in advance, and the bottom row is where they're not. Okay, I'm going to come back to this later so that we can uh, consider the implications of these differences. So having looked at where we are with methods currently, uh, we'd like to propose a research agenda that links uh, synthesis methods to the full breadth of primary research methods available that adopts and adapts methods from elsewhere and addresses the interests of relevant audiences. And I'll take these one at a time. So spanning the primary research methods. Ideally, uh, the more reviews we do, uh, the more we'll be advancing methods for primary research as well as synthesis methods because we'll be exposing common flaws uh, and also promising solutions in primary research. In development and in humanitarian research, we'll also be needing to think more about the upstream formative research, focusing on developing effective interventions, not only on evaluating them. That's because that's as far as we have got in lots of circumstances. And in this way, we can uh, learn across themes and sectors or geographical in remote areas where studies addressing are few and far between. <coughs> so looking at this again, on the whole, the research, the research literature that is well developed is where we can do the reviews on the right hand side, uh, looking at effectiveness testing hypotheses, and where they're less developed we need the methods on the left hand side, uh, looking at more of the formative research. On the right-hand side, we've got opportunities to learn from methods that have been developed in other de disciplines, uh, such as structural equation modeling, and qualitative comparative analysis, and also harmonizing outcomes and measures, uh, which is a lot to in health at the moment, and more could be done in international development. And then thinking about the interests of the relevant audiences. They want to emphasize the importance of contextual influences. They also bring knowledge from their immediate experience and uh, the work organizations and people in the field. So the methods that we want here is not only about finding reliable answers, but asking better questions and involving a broader range of people in shaping uh, synthesis. And taking these one at a time, uh, the con conceptual influences and sustainability. At the moment, systematic reviews uh, quite often uh, investigate some particular dimensions of difference. Um, but less so in a holistic way. We think that there are opportunities to use ecological models to understand uh, better the contextual influences. And sustainability at the moment is dealt with very poorly in systematic reviews. Uh, the meaning isn't always the same. How it's assessed uh, is, is variable. Uh, we know little about the factors of influence, and actually it's quite often ignored altogether.
So coming back to this matrix that I showed earlier, a lot of systematic reviews and syntheses in the area of development and humanitarian research are in the bottom left-hand corner, model three. This is where people are trying to produce uh, evidence as public goods that can be widely used, but it's in areas where there are broad questions and quite often a lack of clarity or agreement about the concepts involved. This tackling this is challenging. In health, it has been done well uh, by the WHO as part of their guideline development, where they've invested heavily, not just in doing systematic reviews, but in driving them as part of a process of developing guidelines and having very wide consultation to be clear about uh, what all the important issues are. And an excellent example is the WHO guideline on task shifting. Absolutely brilliant, but it was such a large piece of work we don't actually know how much it cost. <laughs> but in, certainly in the humanitarian area, I think that there are opportunities to set up similar approach uh, using uh, cluster groups where uh, humanitarian agencies come together in particular sectors to share their learning. And I think there's an opportunity for these groups to discuss what efforts might be useful and to shape reviews that are then tailored to their interests. It will be slow, but I, I hope that it, there's a, a way forward. So, in summary, advancing synthesis methods to better serve development and humanitarian aid. We need to be good at matching existing methods to the questions in the literature available. More can be done adapting existing methods from elsewhere. We need to work harder on methods for asking good questions. And synthesizing what we do know, even where research is limited, and for investigating context and sustainability. And there's potential to embed the production of synthesis like this in the structures and networks of potential users. Indeed, if we don't, I don't think that the outputs will be useful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, so. Um... Thanks, Eduardo. So I, uh, as Eduardo mentioned, I'm from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to mention, I thought Howard was going to do this actually, but um, I'm going to mention uh, the four gaps that were in the CDL proposal. If you spend any time with Howard, you spend your life talking about gaps, it seems like. Uh, and then I'm going to um, kind of outline for you the starting point of the LSHDM Centre for Evaluation and why we're interested in CDL. I'm going to tell you something about some consultations we did on one type of gap. Uh, and then tell you about what we're going to do rather than what we've done. Uh, so there are more questions than answers in the next few minutes. Uh, and then I'm going to invite you to an event. So, so when we were first talking about CEDL, the, the proposal outlines four gaps that CEDL is intended to help with in the world of evaluation for international development. And the work we've been doing as part of this pre-inception inception work has been focused particularly on gaps in methods. And I, I say that uh, partly to give you sort of overall picture of what said I was interested in, but also I, I just wanted to make, I, I don't necessarily believe that the gaps in methodology are the most important gaps in improving evidence-based practice in international development. And as you'll see as I go on, I'm going to talk a little bit about, some, sometimes it's quite different, difficult, I think, to separate out gaps in methods from gaps in practice. One man's gap, you know, we know how to do this and we're going to we just need to do more of it is another person's methodological challenge. And as we thought more and more about, we've principally been thinking about method study, methods for primary studies. But actually, the more and more we've done it, we've started ended up in the same sort of space as Sandy and thinking about some of the things uh, in gaps in synthesis. The, the centre of the school is uh, it's a network based centre, so it's more like an email list than a building. Uh, and it uh, it's brings together about 300 uh, people in the school who are interested in evaluation. It's a huge pool of expertise, therefore, with a huge amount of diversity in experience and interest and quite a lot of opinion. We have uh, PhD students up to world leading researchers, um, including people who've written you know, the definitive books on cluster randomized trials and 
We have many, many statisticians, we have many anthropologists, and the center is a, a broad church. One thing that does bind them together, all, I think you can say, is that they're all interested in public health. Ours is a school of hygiene and tropical medicine. Uh, and CDL is not, not principally supposed to be about health, um, actually. It's about, I think, in, intended to respond to areas in international development that are less evaluated. Um, health is considered to be one that's very much so. And so why were we interested to get involved in this? Well, because uh, I think there is a lot of resonance between what we think of our, as our focus. Our kind of center of gravity of the center for evaluation when I go around the school telling people what it's about is these things on my left hand side. We're interested in studies where people are evaluating complex interventions. We're often much more interested in the interventions that are about changing the behavior of clients or of providers than we are about the drugs and vaccines themselves that many people in the school are interested in. They're almost in, always interested in situations where we're interested in what's going on in real life, and that's either where evaluators are trying to mimic real life, or where the intervention is being delivered in real life and evaluation is a secondary concern. And or in almost all of the cases that, uh, where the sort of center of gravity of the, the uh, center for evaluation is, context is important. The health system that you're working in or the community structure that you're working in is important. That social context is more important than kind of the biological context of people who are working on primary trials of drugs and we put on seminars and symposiums and all of those kinds of things. And we organize our methodological thinking in three themes. And we kind of bring these to CEDAW. We kind of feel like, again, one of the reasons we're interested in this, we do work in public health uh, quite a lot. It is a relatively well-evaluated area. And there's a bit of an orthodoxy about how we think about evaluating complex interventions in real life settings where context is important. And that breaks down into thinking about outcome evaluation, whether that's trials or non-randomized studies or more analytic approaches to answering counterfactual questions. We think about process evaluation and at the center we are very big disciples of the Medical Research Council guidance on process evaluation for complex interventions. And if they don't know that document, it's excellent, uh, at least in scoping out what the remit of process evaluations is. It's not telling you exactly how to do one. Uh, and synthesis. And so we kind of think about that framework of being something that you can apply to many problems and we kind of come to CDL thinking that we bring this sort of framework and apply it to problems that we don't know so much about in international development. In, as part of our CDL work, uh, we, at the beginning we did a bit of consulting on, on gaps. Um, we sent out various emails and we spoke to people and we had various consultations. And so, so we got a few of the things that we got I'm going to share on the next few slides. So we got a long list of, of big problems in international development that are those big challenges for evaluation. Some international development problems uh, pose great challenges here. And this is quite a long list. It, it includes some outcomes, it, uh, you know, nutrition concerns. It includes quite broad sectors like governance. And it includes things like uh, aid delivery mechanisms. And so this is just a kind of long list of the sorts of problems that pose challenges for evaluators in international development. When we were talking to users, they also said something about um, common problems in commissioning evaluations. And one, uh, these are three uh, that came up regularly, and two of them I'm going to focus in on a little bit later. One was people often said that when they funded evaluations or when they commissioned evaluations, they found it hard to know if they were going to get anything about generalizable knowledge. We're going to know a bit about what happened here, but maybe we're not going to know very much for the next time. And they often talked about how it was quite hard if people are doing more qualitative, small n, or using novel evaluation methods. It's just quite hard to know whether to believe them. Um, <laughs> and then we, uh, we talked a lot in these consultations about how it's all very well having this nice framework you have in the LSHGM Center for Evaluation, but in the sorts of contexts relevant to international development, like working in fragile and conflict affected states or within specific programming frameworks, that that uh, and timelines that that poses challenges for evaluation. And we're going to come back to a couple of these in a bit. In our early work, we also brought together methodologists. Um, we, as a group, all agree that, that, that these areas are in international and international development are um, especially complex. And maybe if you can put your finger on two things, it's it's the opportunities to evaluate are rare. You know, many of the people who work in the school of hygiene work on phased evaluations of medications or drugs where. At the end, there's a potential for profit, and you can do that sort of stage of evaluation. In international development, you, you need to be much more opportunistic, and opportunities to evaluate are rare. Plus, context is enormously variable. Almost all cases are almost like unique. And these are particularly difficult challenges if you're trying to think about how can you learn much from evaluation. We talked a lot about things where there is perhaps something like consensus. 
um, maybe people here will disagree with what I think of as consensus, but, but maybe these are sort of areas where we don't need to worry about methods so much. There's probably lots to do to close the knowledge practice gap, but generally people think RCTs, if you can do them, are great, and then we'll follow that immediately by saying that there are many situations where you can't. Um, then people talk about the value of subgroup analyses for understanding for whom and in, uh, for whom, you know, those kind of secondary questions about for whom are things beneficial. Um, there's a general consensus that investing unintended effects is important, mm -hmm. that theories of change are useful to guide evaluations of this type, and that mixing methods is something we should be doing. <coughs> we found a bit less consensus on a few things. You can argue forever with methodologists about the best uh, designs when you can't do a trial. Um, that can go on forever. We, we talked a lot about how, although people all, all say it's possible to do this, but how actually you should investigate mechanisms of action and how you should properly think about using theories of change to guide evaluation. There's a lot, I think there is a methods gap there. We went into the, to the consultations also particularly thinking about people say all of the time they're going to do a process code evaluation, an outcome, or an impact evaluation. And then often those two things kind of stay quite separate and they don't get brought together and there aren't really good guidance for bringing them together to generate. Uh, and we talked a lot about where it, you know, trials were obsessed by pre-specifying some things, but there are also some things in evaluation where it's not good to pre-specify and it's good to be led by your known people. We talked a little bit about those things, and the three, the three things that are highlighted in red here, we talk a little bit about in this pre-inception paper that we've done for CEDAW with this uh, author group. And if you're going to characterize them all together, it's all about, I think, about how to learn more for next time. I think we've got all very interested by the idea that in international development particularly, we need to set up evaluation studies in such a way that they are explicitly helpful for making future decisions. And because context is variable and because things change a lot, that's really hard. And that's the kind of nut we like to crack in our the, the next bit of work we're going to do. And just as a sort, this is a straw man example, it's probably unfair, but this is a uh, taken out of a different evidence report on agricultural interventions for nutritional outcomes, and it's kind of a summary of the evidence of us, different types of interventions on some primary outcomes, and it basically says it's all inconsistent and mixed. <laughs> now, of course, this document says a lot more about these things, but as a straw man anthropologist, like, we, we want to learn more, don't we, just than the sort of binary yes-no question about whether something works that goes into a synthesis that then says the evidence is inconsistent or mixed. And I think we think that there is a space to set up evaluations in a way that you get a bit more from them than those um, types of answers than we do. And so the, the two sort of big methods gaps that we're going to be working in under cell for the next little while are this thing about how best to learn more for next time. And I'll show you a little bit, a bit more and um, flesh on the bones about in a second. And, and we're also very interested in how best to learn more for now. I'm going to try, try and do it three of them. <laughs> um, so we're going to. This is a. We're going to write two papers as part of the, the inception phase of CEDL, um, which intended to be helpful for CEDL work that starts commissioning evaluations. The first one is on conducting and reporting evaluations to support this idea of transferable knowledge, um, and we're bringing together this very diverse group of people, including people from the Centre for Evaluation, but also people who, are, who don't work in public health, um, all of whom are involved in, in CEDL, and. We're going to flesh out a bit more some of these things that I've highlighted as themes. We're very interested in, in maybe there are ways of characterizing uh, what's going on in an evaluation that we, we, we've been talking about as mid-level theory. It's not just describe the intervention and say whether it works or not, but can you describe the intervention in such a way that you can extract from the evaluation learning that would be useful in other settings? We've got very interested in the idea of interventions actually as being kind of like a theory made real. Like if you have an intervention, some, whether it's explicit or not, there's a theory in there about how it's working and why it's working. And if you put a bit more focus on what that theory is, then what the nuts and bolts of the intervention are, then you can learn a bit more. Um, so that's one thing we're going to work on. And then the second one, we, we've got really interested in these ideas about you know, the, the phenomenon that people often want to learn, not just for next time, but they also want to improve programs as they're on the ground right now. And in clinical trials, uh, you know, that we've started thinking about adaptive trial designs that allow you to start off with lots of candidate molecules and, get, and then bin them down. And we wonder whether there is some, some, some of that we could transport into these more complex evaluation settings. Can we do a bit more of a critical analysis of the process by which the data gets back to people who make decisions on the basis of it and understand that a bit better and what are the better or worse ways of doing that? So we're 
with this team of people, we're going to try and get into that space. And with that in mind, um, I would like to invite you all to an event on the 23rd of November, and being put on by the Centre and the CEDL, which is at the Wellcome Trust, who are uh, kindly hosting us. And it's a day-long um, uh, symposium on timely evaluation for program improvement. You're all very welcome. It's free to register. Uh, but you have to register. Uh, if you Google, I've tried it before I came. If you Google timely evaluation, get it. <laughs> but also this uh, small URL will get you there. Um, I heard earlier that there are 150 people registered already. Um, you might get an email saying that you're um, on a waiting list, but I, I reckon a good few people will have that. So said was going to try and go at these four gaps, and the stuff we've been doing today has been driving at methods gaps. We're going to try and get a bit further into these two types of problems, and then Jenny wanted to put up that. I don't know what it is. <laughs> 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 <Okay>. <laughs>